come together as your body. Thing of 
what they would be taught. He did all of his father. And you even prepared him to, uh, even in man's uh, understanding, to reveal uh, uh, Jesus as the Savior. And father, I thank you for this. I thank you that, that your will cannot be for us, Father, and that, that we can trust in all things. So be glorified, be exalted. So I'd be kind of interested if anybody's willing to step up and say something. Uh, what, what did you what did you get out of last week's beginning? Did you learn something different or was something maybe brought up you hadn't thought of before? As far as remember what we were doing. Uh, we're looking at the three messianic miracles. And you like I said, you won't find this in scripture. Okay? <laughs> this is something that the Pharisee taught. Okay? This is not in scripture. And if you remember, we, we kind of touched on the history, uh, and I related related the fact that you're, you see nothing about Pharisees in the Old Testament, and yet when the New Testament picks up, the Pharisees are there, and they're strong, and they're basically uh, in control of all the religious activities and so forth, right? I mean, they're there. So where, why, how did that come about? So so we see that we take scripture, scripture first and foremost, we we interpret everything by scripture, right? What's a the Greek or Latin, uh, Latin term? It's all scripture. Scripture alone. Okay, well, that's kind of true. Because we can also look at history and see how, and see how history uh, also is laid out and what God did in, in through that. But first and foremost, it has to line up with scripture. Okay? So we see that from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the sect of the Pharisees came into being. And uh, I had done deeply into this, but it appears, uh, without doing that, but without digging into it really deeply, that sometime during the Babylonian captivity, this began to take place. Remember that the temple had been destroyed, they were, uh, Israel had been scattered throughout much of the world before this, before Judah had, and then the Babylonians came and, and took uh, uh, Judah in three different ways to the battle. So they didn't have the temple to worship at, and they, they couldn't follow what God had said in the law. Okay, but they, that's when they began to develop the synagogues and so forth. Remember, synagogues are there too. You never read nothing about them in the Old Testament. So all this developed during this 400 years of silence, from the time of the Babylonian captivity until the New Testament when Jesus was born. Okay, so through this we also have a lot of history, and Daniel covers some of this. He talks about some of the kings. We have the Babylonians, we have the Assyrians, I mean, we have the Babylonians, we have the Medes and Persians, we have the Greeks, and then we have the Romans, all those empires. And when Jesus is born, the Roman Empire is, is basically the empire of the world, of the known world at that, of that time, the world at that time. Okay? <clears throat> all right. The Pharisees begin to develop and begin to add to the Mosaic Law. All right. We know that the law of Moses, roughly the people, the scholars who counted, say there's 613 commandments. But they begin to take each commandment and further explain in their opinion. And over time, which may not have been a bad thing, I don't know, but what happened over time was bad. Because as they added to the Mosaic law, they began to say and teach that these laws that they added had equal weight with God's law. And then they want to step further than that, and they said, actually, it has a greater effect on God's law. And you naturally can see in Scripture. Uh, it talks about uh, the Pharisees talking about something horrible. In other words, it's dedicated to God. Alright? So what, what that actually meant, see, that was something that they come up with. So what that meant is that a man can say, what I've got is dedicated to God. And therefore, because it's dedicated to God, he did not have to take care of his parents when they got home. And that's not in God's, that's not God's will at all. 
In fact, here's the thing that they added to it is that it's, I'm going to say it's dedicated to God, so therefore I can't take care of my parents, but I don't actually have to give it to God. That sounds kind of interesting, doesn't it? That sounds like something man would come up, a fallen man would come up with, so he could keep what he had and not worry about anybody else. And they begin to say that that had more weight than the Mosaic Law. So that's kind of where we're at. All right? Now, the Pharisees throughout this time, this 400 years, begin to develop what, what they call the oral law tradition. And through this, they taught that there were three miracles that only the Messiah could do. Okay? It's not, it's not what the Bible says. This is what they taught. So if, as we read the New Testament scriptures, and we, we started looking last week about the healing of the leper. And remember that, that this is something they said that only the Messiah could do was heal a, a Jewish leper. Okay? And that had never been done since the completion of the law. And then all of a sudden, what? Jesus did it. You know? And there were certain things that they had to do because of it. Okay? Now, but before that, the bigger context here, too, is that you heard me say that John the Baptist came preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And after he was taken in prison, it says in Scripture, we found out right to you, that Jesus began to say, began to preach, uh, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. How would the Jews have understood that? See, they're going to understand it based on what the Old Testament says and what they've been taught. Okay? So I'm going to just read a passage to you. This is one of many, many, many passages that gives you an understanding of what that phrase would have meant to them. See, they didn't understand, and the Old Testament doesn't talk about the church age, basically. So they would not even have understood the mystery form of the kingdom that, that you hear Paul uh, talking about. Okay, so if you would, uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. And remember, this is just one of many. But they were looking for this kingdom. And that's what John the Baptist said. 
Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He came to offer the Jewish nation that kingdom in God's perfect knowledge. He knew that they would reject it once again. And therefore, we have the mystery form of the kingdom, the church age, all right? But understand, if we're studying this, he's coming to offer the kingdom to the Jews, just like he said he would. And there's a lot more in the day. If you look at what he said about John the Baptist, you can see it a lot more clear. Okay? But for, for now, push the I believe button. Or no, it's okay. But I'm telling you, that's where I'm going to be coming from, okay? All right, so he comes to offer the kingdom. He healed the Jewish leper. So, uh, let me read to you uh, a verse here, and we're, we're studying in chronological order, okay? That, that's, that's huge, too. You, some of y'all heard me say one of the most fascinating studies I've ever done is looked at the gospel in chronological order from a Jewish perspective. Man, there's so many passages that I struggle with. I've still got some. So many passages that I struggle with came alive when I did this in chronological order and from a Jewish perspective. That's context. Okay? That's context. Alright. If you would, turn to Mark uh, chapter 2. Verse 1. Jesus has just healed the leper. Okay? And he's told him what? To remember to go and Show yourself to the priest. What was the key phrase after that? Do you remember? This, this is important. The key phrase he said after that, as a testimony to them. To who? To the priest. To the leadership. Go and show yourself that you have been a leper, that you have been cured as a testimony to them. So without saying a word to the leadership, Jesus said, your Messiah is here. I'm coming to offer the kingdom that God has promised in passage after passage after passage after passage in the Old Testament. Okay? Look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of Mark. And when, and when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterwards, it was heard that he was at home. Okay. Several days after, we were not told exactly how many days, but after what? After the healing of the leper. Alright? So, if you remember last week, uh, according to the Mosaic Law, if a leper was healed, they had to uh, immediately sacrifice two birds. One was uh, killed, one was set free. And then they had, had to do an investigation to see if the leper, if this guy had truly been a leper, if he had been a leper, was he truly healed? And how was he healed? What were the circumstances? You know, the Mosaic Law in Leviticus 13, uh, 13 and 14 basically laid this out. All right. So this has happened at this point. Think about this, too. I wonder if the priests do what they were supposed to do. This has never happened. You know, they may have had to spend all night studying what Scripture said, what the Mosaic Law said, to prepare to do what they were supposed to do. I, I don't know. It's just, just a question that come up in my mind. You know, because they never, they never had to do it before. And remember, there's 613 laws in the Mosaic Law, plus all the, the ones that they really focused on, which were the oral law, which was thousands of them. But either way, they have, they have done what they're supposed to do at this point. Jesus has gone back to his home base in Capernaum. All right? All right, now if you would, turn to uh, Luke chapter 5. Luke is the gospel that is written in chronological order. That's how you tell what's chronological. Now, there's a lot of things that happen in the other ones that, that fall in between some of the verses of Luke. And that's a, I'm not sure if any man knows exactly, you know, there, there are studies done on that. that uh, the, the one that we use was A.T. Robinson's uh, Harmony of the Gospels and how it all fit together. Okay, but, you know, once again, that's uh, something that man has done. That's not scripture, okay? Okay, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. So Jesus has gone back to Capernaum, and we're talking several days later, maybe a week, two 
good week, whatever. Look at verse 17 of Luke chapter 5. And it came about one day that he was teaching. And there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. That seems like a very simple verse. And on the surface it is. I want you to think about something. Jesus has, has begun his ministry, and I don't know exactly how long it's been going, but it's very, very early in the, in the early stages of ministry. He, at this point, he has not even selected all his apostles. So this is early in his ministry. So let me ask you a question. As he is in uh, his home base, the region of Capernaum and so forth, and he's teaching, it says there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. Why? Why were they there? It says from every village. So every, evidently, every synagogue sent a representative. How did they know to do this? And why were they there? That's interesting. Let me read you something uh, from Arnold Rosenbaum. I read a lot of his material. He is a he is a Jewish he is a Messianic Jew. In other words, he's a Jew who has accepted Jesus as Messiah. He has done extensive research on Jewish tradition uh, and what the ancient rabbis taught. Okay, now he can be wrong, right? He's just a man. He can be wrong. Based on the studies he's done. Listen to this. Arnold Rosenbaum states that according to Sanhedrin law, if there was any kind of messianic movement, the Sanhedrin had to investigate in two stages. The first stage was a stage of observation in which a delegation was formed to investigate only, and this is key, only by the way of observation. They were to observe what was being said, done, and taught. They were not allowed to ask any questions or to raise any objections. If this observation, if after this observation, the delegates were to return to Jerusalem and report to the Sanhedrin to give a verdict, if the movement, the Messianic movement, if it was found to be insignificant, the matter was dropped. Okay? If the movement was found was considered to be significant, the second stage of the investigation was to begin. This was called the stage of interrogation. During this stage, the delegates would ask questions and raise objections to discuss, to discover if the Messianic claims or would be accepted or rejected. This is according to what the Sanhedrin said. Remember, the Sanhedrin was the ruler, uh, the priests and the Pharisees, you know, the upper echelon, shall we say. Okay, so let me ask this question again. If yeah. they discovered that Jesus had, that a leper had been cured, never had been done before in Jewish history after the law, they performed what was supposed to be done. And according to uh, what the Mosaic law said, they found that the man was, had done a leper, he had been cured, and Jesus had done it. What was their next move? Their next move was to find out about this guy. He seems to be the Messiah. Think about it. They did the same thing with John the Baptist. You know, they came to John the Baptist and asked him, you know, are you the Messiah? So they thought this might have been a messianic, messianic movement. Of course, John said, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the prophet. The one coming is great for that. So they let that go. But now they're coming to investigate if Jesus is the Messiah. And remember what they taught. Only the Messiah could heal a man. So that is why all these Pharisees and teachers of the law were in Capernaum. This is about 80 miles from Jerusalem. Why would they go from Jerusalem in 
slowed down to hear him. It's just his, his ministry has just started. They really don't know a whole lot about him. But they're there from all over him. Every village is sent one. So they're there to find yeah. out. Do we need to investigate further? And remember the first stage is to go and it's do what? Not say a word. We're just gonna go and we're gonna listen. And we're gonna observe. Yeah, that'd be tough on me. <laughs> It'd really be tough on me not to say a word and just listen. Not to ask questions. But that's what they're supposed to do. All right, so that brings us to to our uh, the story today. All right, let's go back to uh, uh, verse 18. So the Pharisees and teachers are all there from all of Jerusalem, and it says the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal. Okay? Now there's a lot of things we can talk about, and, you, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this story. A lot of things, but let's not lose focus on what we're looking at. Remember, Jesus is coming. Basically saying, I am the Messiah. The kingdom of God is here for you if you will accept it. Verse 18. And behold, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in to set him down in front of him. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the pile with his stretcher. Right in the center. Jesus. You're, you're all familiar with the story, right? Well, there were so many people in this house. This, probably this square, you know, they had a lot of open areas in their houses and so forth, in their courtyards. They couldn't get him in there. Why, why were there so many people there? Were, were, were people coming to be healed and, and to hear to hear him teach? But there were Pharisees and teachers of the law from all over the country, from every village. So there was a lot of people there to hear him teach, to say, is this Messiah? And seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. All right. Let's try to think through this a little bit. They let this man down. Jesus sees it. And these guys are still up. I'm just picturing this. I don't know. This is how, how I, I'm picturing They're letting him down the road. Four of them. I don't know. Those guys are real steady on that road. You know, if I back on, on the on the top, I'm going to lose. Let me down even, you know. They lay down in front of Jesus. You know, I'm sure Jesus is teaching the Pharisees, and all of a sudden these roots start coming off. You know, and they lay down. And Jesus says, Marvel at whose faith? It's their faith. Doesn't say anything about the man who's sick having his faith. He may have had it, but he, Jesus says nothing about his faith at all. But he says, He marveled at their faith. So we, we see once again the importance of faith, right? Faith is so important. But whose faith? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of scripture uh, when Jesus heals and so forth that it's not always the person of the faith getting healed. Sometimes it's those who bring it. Sometimes it's the one doing the healing. Sometimes it's, the, it's all, you know, but it's not consistent. But what we can say is that faith is important. It's absolutely important. It's necessary. Faith is necessary. Okay, so he let them down. Jesus uh, remarks about their, he says about their faith. And then what's the Son, your sins are forgiven. Now that's not his usual way to heal, is it? Has, did he ever do that before? I mean, there could be, I'm not sure. I can't remember. But he focuses on the fact that, Son, your sins are forgiven. Why? Why did he look up and see their faith? See, the fact that this man needed to be healed, he was paralyzed. He could have been paralyzed from the neck down. I don't know. But he was pretty much helpless. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Could there be a reason he did that? Well, think about it for a minute. And look what it says. Look what it says. Next verse. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? If you go back and look at the account of Mark, it says that they get some reason in their heart. In other words, it was all silent. Why was it silent? They were in the first stage of investigation where they could not say anything out loud. They could not object out loud. 
So they're thinking in their heart. Who is this guy? He's blaspheming. Which is speaking evil of God, and talks bad about God, a lie about God, all that in Tyler, I mean, all that's included in blasphemy. But then they then they reason in their heart. Only God. So it, it gets, that brings me to a, a point sometimes, you know, I listen to a lot of different people. I read a lot of different people. And I disagree with a lot they say. But I trust God enough that even though I may disagree with most of what they say, they, can, they still know something that I don't know. They can still teach me. God can use them to teach me something. I don't want to be under their control. I don't want to trust everything they say. I gotta run it through scripture. But God can use them, even though I don't agree with maybe most of what they teach. You know? To teach me something about him that I don't know. He can do that. He will do that. I'll guarantee you. Uh, I but I, I read I read Bob after uh, Dr. Christian Bob because there's a study he's done. I don't agree with everything he says. It's simply I do not agree. I'm not gonna agree with it. Because I think he's wrong. You know, he I'm sure he laughed at me. Indicating him having a doctor and all that, said, that's okay, I don't mind being laughed at. It's all right. <laughs> but God can use the smallest child to teach us something if we're willing to hear, if we're willing to listen. But they're saying, this guy's blaspheming. They come to investigate and they say, he's blaspheming. Only God. by their own testimony say only God can forgive sin. This man has said he can forgive sin. So he's basically saying he's God, right? Isn't that what he's saying? He's either nuts or he's thinking he's God. And that's the conclusion they basically come to. He's either nuts, he's a, he's a black man, because he sure ain't God, sure. Verse 22. But Jesus, aware of their reason, in fact, the Spirit of God was acting in Jesus. He'd already read their mind when this took place. He read their mind. He knew by the Spirit what they were thinking. That should have done enough evidence right there to really start leading to the fact that maybe this isn't the fact. But Jesus, aware of their reason, answered and said to them, Why are you reading in your heart? Which is easier to say your sins have been forgiven or to say, Right? And walk. Well, it's obvious, right? If someone is paralyzed and they come in here, I can sit up there all day long and say, son, your sins are forgiven. And there's no external proof that that's taking place, is there? None. So that's what Jesus is saying. Which one's easier to do? To say, son, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, right? And walk. Verse 24. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your stretcher, and go home. And at once he rose up before them and took up what he had been laying on and went home, glorifying God. So what's Jesus just done? He basically said to them, by your own words that you were thinking of, silently, only God can forgive sin. And he basically said, to prove that I am God. Even though I was born in Nazareth, even though it looks like I came from Mary and Joseph, that they're, they're illegitimate sons, I am God. So to prove that to you, get up.
And they were all seized with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled, and they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. So Jesus has basically said, I am your Messiah. I am God. I am offering the kingdom to you. And he showed them. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta really check into this because this is what's happening. So as we look, and as we will look further in our study, we're going to see that there's that they have begun the second stage, where they begin to question and they begin to ask and to object to different things. The truth is, and this is good too, guys. Remember, we're, we're to test the spirits, right? Every one of us to test the spirits. Got to line up the scripture. Show the nature of God and all that, you know. Test the spirit. That's a good thing. For all of us at all times. But we're going to see that they reject it. So as we continue our study, why? We're going to look into it, but why would they reject it? Even of what and think about this too. They have just done all this in secret. They have taught this for years to the Jewish population in the synagogue. All the people as a general rule, I'm going to say all. I'm going to say the majority of the people who went to synagogue knew what they had taught. And as we go through our lesson, and we're going to see some of the things that they say is indication of that. Okay? More flavor to it, doesn't it? It makes to me, it makes it make it come alive a little bit more. You know? So I kind of I relate that to us today. What has Jesus said and proven throughout history, maybe in our own lives, that we reject him about? Or that we get worried about? Or that we get scared about? You know? See, it always comes back to, you know, are you going to?
Pharisees said that, he taught that. But here's, here's the bottom line. Because he did not fit their mold. How many times do we read about the controversies that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the priests over healing on the Sabbath? Why was, what was the problem? The problem was, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and they do no work, right? I mean, that's what the law says. I mean, that's what the Mosaic law says. They added thousands. If my memory is correct, this was that one commandment. They added over 1,500 laws to that. And that's man's law. It's what Jesus didn't agree with. And that's what Jesus didn't. Uh, that's what he broke. What the Pharisees said was even more binding than Mosaic law. And instead of seeing their mistake, 